So welcome everyone to uh, our 2021 webinar series. It's great that you can join us. Thank you. I'm Anna Popovich, Program Director at Humanist Canada, and I will moderate today's conversation about building humanist communities. This workshop will be 90 minutes in length, and uh, we will begin with two brief presentations. And uh, I will then invite you to continue the conversation in smaller groups in breakout rooms. And uh, we will reconvene in the main room for a group discussion. You can use the chat at the bottom of the screen to submit questions or comments anytime. I'd also like to mention that this meeting is being recorded. So if you want to remain anonymous, you can turn off your video and you can also change your name and you can do so by clicking on your name um, on the right hand side of the screen. And our presenters today are Doug Thomas, uh, who is Director of Society of Free Thinkers, also free, and uh, co-founder of Secular Connexion Seculaire, CSC, and the leader of community organizations such as the Woolwich Chamber of Commerce, Canadian Figure Skating Association, and the local Architectural Conservation Committee. Doug holds a degree that folk in history that focused on constitutions, and he uses his experience to organize secular humanist communities across the country. And our second speaker, Martin Frith, has been a member of Humanist Canada since 1986 and an officiant since 2002. He is the current president of Humanist Canada and uh, has been an advocate for civic and social engagement and uh, believes and believes that connecting with others on the local, national and international level is essential. His goal is to see Humanist Canada grow in membership and uh, national influence and continue to be an agent of change. Martin lives in Toronto, has a private practice in relationship counseling, grief and bereavement, and is also an active recreational athlete. He holds a Master of Divinity from St. Michael's College at U of T, and uh, is also a clinical fellow with the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. Thank you both for joining us. Um, and uh, maybe we can, we can begin by just doing a quick poll. Uh, or a uh, yeah, a couple of quick polls, and we'll begin with poll one, uh, just to know where you are located. So, uh, seventy-six percent of us are on the call today are from Ontario. We have uh, uh, one person right now from BC, and uh, uh, one from Quebec, and uh, two from other, which might be. Uh, International. Ireland, Ireland is one of them. We we have a, a someone who is calling from Ireland. So welcome Fantastic. everybody. I'm not seeing any poll results on my end for some reason. So Martin, thanks, thanks for that. Happy to. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and uh, so the uh, Doug and Martin thinking about best practices in community building. I wonder if we could begin the conversation by addressing the following oh. yeah and i was just going to suggest you want to pop up the other uh there's an uh the second poll the second poll right away i was going to do it in a second but sure we can we can do it right now great so uh launch poll so are you a member of miss canada or any other local group Don't be shy. And again, I'm not seeing any results coming in on my end, so I'll give it five more seconds. And share results. Okay. So the results are 61% uh, of you are a member of Humanist Canada. 39% uh, are not. Um, uh, we won't ask you why uh, uh, on this call. Um, are you currently a member of a local humanist group? And 67% are, and 33% are not. 
Okay, that's helpful information. Okay. That's yeah, useful to know. And finally, poll number three. So, 80, would you mm -hmm. like to form part of a humanist group in your area? 86% said yes, and uh, uh, one person or 14% said no. Would you be interested in starting a unimus group? Would you like to form in part your area? Of, would you, yes. Oh, would yeah. you like? To, would you be interested in starting a humanist group in your area? And uh, uh, five people said yes, and uh, and uh, and one person indicated uh, perhaps sometime in the future. Okay. There we go. So we hope. Uh, with today's call, you'll be able to take away some tools to uh, that might help you move forward with that idea. Okay, thank you, everyone, and thanks, Martin. So, uh, when thinking about best practices in community building, we thought that we could address three uh, key questions: What is a humanist community, and why do we need one? Where do you start, and how do you sustain the community? and what challenges do humanist groups face and how can we overcome it? So with that, um, over to you, Doug and Martin. And you can unmute yourselves. And I think, Doug, you're gonna take it away yeah. to- uh, Over to you, Doug. To start. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start, yeah. And I think, uh, Anna, you were gonna put some slides up for me, so. Sure. Um, that's great. No, I'm not. Oh, there they are. Okay, okay good. So uh, I just wanted to take a brief moment to uh, introduce this idea. And, and I'm going to exercise my boomer rights here and point out that I'm talking about real groups, not Facebook, et cetera. Uh, I regard local as within transit or driving range. In other words, a city or area. Convenience is very important. Um, and I also want to put the little caveat here that I do not have any magical formula for this. Um, these are some ideas that hopefully some people can carry forward, but uh, it is not, um, doesn't seem easy to, um, to form a group. Anyway, so next slide, please. And then we'll try to define what a community is. Um, and I look at it as a, it's people who want to share a fellowship based on a common goal or philosophy. So the fellowship thing is important. You might have a common goal with somebody, but not really want to meet with them or whatever, or maybe it's a temporary alliance. But it's a community is one that either comes together naturally to share that fellowship based on a common goal. Uh, you may see a need or you may have a solution. You want to help each other. Um, you enjoy a main activity together. So your secular humanist group might arise out of being in a curling club and finding people who think the same thing. Or you want to share knowledge or philosophy. So you want to get together and say, well, you know, I, I really want to share this with you. Uh, I know that sounds a bit evangelical, but ultimately there, that's we have to have that component in there. Um, Common philosophies, also very important. So I guess next slide, please. Good. So that from there, we got to figure out what's a humanist community. And I'm going to, again, exercise my bias. I'm talking about a secular humanist community. So these are the, the common philosophy is people who try to follow and promote the Amsterdam principles from uh, the 1952 uh, Amsterdam meeting. Uh, of course, 50 years later, they came up with the 2002 ones. And to be honest with you, I think they got into the 2002 ones, they, the, the one-line statements became paragraphs. And to me, that was sort of like calling a spade a ferrously augmented monolevered earth moving device. And I just think that 1952 ones are simpler, they're more direct. Um, and when you, if you are trying to follow those principles, and I don't know that anybody really manages it completely, um, then you know that you're going to be helping other people and probably going to focus in the secular humanist community on helping other non-believers. 
Um, I'm not a sociologist, but I can tell you that in people I've met, the process of moving out of the religious meme and the community that religions have set up, and that is a very strong community, um, can be quite traumatic. And we need to have a, that's one of the functions of a group it needs to be, or a community needs to be support other non-believers. Um, it needs to be a way to network uh, to get things done, to, uh, to accomplish things locally and ultimately uh, nationally. Um, so the, the secular humanist community is distinguished from other communities by that core set of principles and the need and desire to help other non-believers. So I guess we can move to the next slide, please. And that's, I kind of segued into our why, um, help our fellow secular humans can cope with society. Um, I know that as working with SCS, that I get um, emails from people. Um, my favorite one to comment on is a fellow in a relatively local community here who emailed me instead of a problem. Uh, they're putting a nativity display up in the, in the, the uh, township office. I don't think they should be doing that. I have the right to freedom from religion, but I don't know what to do about it. And of course, what he was really saying is, I don't want to center myself out by doing this. So I said, well, give me the contact people and I'll write a letter from SES and then it's kind of neutral. And if, then if you want to write a letter, you'll know you'll have the support. You can basically say we have the support uh, of this national group. Um, of course, playing on the factor that when politicians get something on a letterhead, they, they tend to react to it more than they would a private individual. Um, now, they didn't take that nativity scene down that year, but they didn't put one up the next year. So sometimes the results are very slow in coming, but the fact that he was able to reach out and say, hey, you know, here's a group to support me, on another occasion, I was at a public concert and just happened to notice one of my fellow members of So Free across the audience line, and we got went to intermission. He reached out and said, wow, it really feels good to have somebody else in the audience that I know is one of my fellow travelers. And I, so that's really important that this whole idea of we, we as social beings need to relate to people who have the same social goals as ours. And the other one is that there's no clear, that there's very clear rather that there's systemic discrimination against atheists in Canada and in the world. Now in Canada, fortunately, most of that discrimination is in the favor of favor, in the form of favoritism toward religious people, but we still have to, to end it. Um, you can't do that as an individual. Strangely enough, even though human rights are an individual thing in, in Canada, so you're, it's your individual rights that you have to defend, it's much easier to do that if you're a member of a group. So they I mean the, the case with the Saguenay City Council opening its meetings with a prayer, actually a mini religious service, um, the fact that the individual who complained about that was got support from at least two secular humanist organizations in Quebec not only in terms of finances, but in terms of moral support, that went to the Supreme Court and they made the decision that it's unconstitutional to open municipal council meetings with uh, a prayer. So that's the kind of thing that we have to do. And remember, systemic discrimination occurs in two ways. It's stuff that's actually written in the laws and there are laws in Canada that are that do discriminate against atheists. And the other one is the failure of people in charge to uh, recognize and support the right to freedom from religion, for example. So again, that's why we need secular humanist groups to support individuals, but also to support our overall goal of ending systemic discrimination against atheists. Next slide, please. Okay, so purpose. Well, if you, again, I go back to start with the Amsterdam principles. If you can start with those and you will see the different purposes that your group could have. It might be that you want to focus on the environment. 
which is included in those principles. It might be that you want to focus on um, the people. You, you need to decide based on that, what's the greatest need in our community? Now, of course, Martin and I would tell you that we really want you to see that the national goal is very important too. But you may have a situation where you know that if you have a good solid group, you can help out with homelessness and hunger or aggressive religious groups that are actually taking advantage of young people or whatever. And of course, the issue of discrimination in the community. And it doesn't necessarily have to be discrimination against atheists. It might be racial discrimination. Uh, it might be, um, you know, I mean, and that's really important. For example, one of the big reasons that we are SCS is look going after section 319.3b of our criminal code is it allows fundamentalist Christians to attack Jews and write hate literature about Jews. Well, you know, that's not, and of course, uh, attack us as well. But but the point is, it doesn't matter that, that it's not only us, it's also Jewish people that suffer from that. We really, we really need to pitch in there and fix the problem in our broader community. Next slide, please. Okay, whom do you want to attract? Well, I mean, again, we're, do we want to see non-believers who see the Amsterdam principles as valid? It is difficult because there are some atheists who are really, I will say they're almost antisocial. They don't want to join a group. They don't want to participate. They see anything that's done. And of course, any if they get any perception of hierarchy, they're not going to join anyway. But you do want to see you you must see people who see the Amsterdam principles as valid, even if they don't fully accept them. Um, and that's who you'd like to see in your group. People who want to work for more than just society for non-believers. In other words, are they prepared to help with a food drive and stand side by side with a Christian to serve people food um, and helping the homeless, the hungry, and so on? And then, of course, the people who suffer from their exit from religion. So that's a, those are people you want to have in your group. Um, and that's that's people that you need to help. They need to be feel welcome and they need to feel supported. So it's very important that they are attracted to your group. Um, in terms of socioeconomic uh, differences, that, that should not be a factor. And certainly not race um, or any other for that matter, any other uh, distinguishing idea. But th I think those are the principal people that you want to try to get into your group. Next slide, please. Okay, how do we do this? <laughs> well, uh, and I left a word off there. Find a few people who see the same problem as you see. That, that you know, you that there's not a, not a lot of, opportunity or not a lot of benefit in going after people who disagree with you to trying to form a group. I mean, disagree in details, yes, but disagree in the overall, do you see a problem with the way atheists are treated and the way the non-believers are treated? Uh, focus on the so secular humanist community. Uh, Sofri had a slogan that's that kind of gone by the wayside because somebody didn't like the negative without in it, but good without gods, you're not alone. In other words, let people know that there is a community. Uh, year after year, Sofri's was at the Multicultural Festival in Kitchener, and we would always have people come up, oh, you must be a new group. We've never seen you before. Well, Sofri's been around since 1992. And so it, obviously there's a lot more um, evangelization or a lot more proselytization has to go on about secular humanist communities. But you want to let people know you're not alone because so many atheists out there think, I'm the only one in the city. I'm the only one in my community. So some of the things you can use are uh, posters, uh, social media promotion, word of mouth, a key one, regular events at one location. So if you're going to have a poster, you're going to have, for example, good, uh, what a simple three line, good without gods, you are not alone, website and uh, monthly meeting at this time in this place. Um, keep it 
regular and and have at least one meeting that's there all the time every it doesn't matter whether it doesn't matter whether there's another holiday on or not just you make sure it's there next okay what are the challenges well unlike our neighbors to the south atheists are very comfortable in canada you can live your entire life as an atheist and never be confronted because we're too polite about it or you're confronted so politely that there's not much you can do about it, right? Um, so it's we, we do feel too comfortable. So our American friends, you if you're an atheist, you're very likely to get some Christian in your face all the time. Um, and so we feel uh, as if, well, it's not that important. Maybe it, it, I don't have to do it today. I can put it off. So with this Thomas rambling on about 319, 3B and about the Canadian National Anthem, what a kook. It doesn't affect me. It's not my thing. Okay. Except with the National Anthem, your kids are being subjected to religion every day they walk into school. It's being forced upon them. Is that important to you or not? You have to decide that. Non-believers are skeptical about dogma, rules, conformity, and belonging and any sense of hierarchy. Uh, you really need to be careful that in your group, you don't have a hierarchy. So if you're as a leader of a group or a uh, founder of a group, you're perceived as someone who wants to be Pope, um, you're going to be dead in the water very quickly. You're not going to get those people. The other factor is just people are so busy surviving at whatever socioeconomic they're living. I mean, everybody now has challenges making the rent payments, making whatever and so on. Um, and and they have to, that's time consuming. You've got to take the kids here, there, and everywhere to get them into skating and skiing and hopefully curling uh, and all these things. But um, and so do you have time to go to this meeting once a week? Is the meeting open to so your children can come with you? That's something you have to look after too. Um, and the second thing is that people really don't think in terms of abstract values. They're not affected. If it doesn't cost them more taxes, it doesn't prohibit them from driving where they want to. Um, if they are not, uh, you know, if they're not forced to do anything. You see what's happened with COVID when some people got the perception that they were going to be forced to have vaccines. Complete, out of control libertarianism um, was completely irrational. But that's kind of what it is. They don't see. It's tough to get people to see that when I do this, I'm helping the community even though I know, know immediately that it's going to help me. Next slide. Okay, what are the solutions? Okay, promote solution for all age groups. Make sure that it's supportive of all. Again, make sure that you have ability, at least the children can come with their parents and feel comfortable. There's something for them to do. Uh, make sure that the event is, and, and so that could be an event during the daytime. You maybe have the odd family event. Um, make sure that you're promoting all age groups. So a university student has to be comfortable with old guys like me. Make sure they're welcome and make sure you get and, and welcome them. Allow people freedom to approach the principles on their own terms. Somebody might be really focused on the environment. Somebody else might be focused on human rights and equality. Whatever it is, they have to have, you have to provide them a mechanism to do that. Uh, make it accessible time and money so if you're going to have a monthly brunch which is what so free's had great success with you have to make sure that it's not going to cost somebody 15 or 20 bucks for breakfast when that's going to be a hurdle for them uh, they have to be able to get there on transit they have to feel that they can afford it and you have to work on making abstract ideas relative to non-believers you got to figure out how does that abstract idea or that's what they think think is an abstract idea, touch them. How does that definitely um, affect their life or potentially affect their life? That's probably the hardest one to do. And that way you hopefully can engage them. Okay, next slide, unless that's the end. That is the end. Over to you, Martin. There we go. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for that, Doug. And uh, there we go. And uh, so um, I'm actually 
going, not going to use any slides. I'm actually for the first time going low tech today, uh, uh, given the format of our uh, of our gathering, and I'm going to call on a couple of people as well to share some uh, some thoughts as before we. Uh, go off into uh, to small groups. So uh, thanks, Doug. You actually uh, laid some groundwork that's fantastic um, and very much focused on, on, on uh, you know, a starting place, for example, of the Amsterdam principles. And I'm actually going to step back for a moment and to look at just some broader pieces that might be helpful for folks. Now, in my conversations with um, uh, just about everyone who runs a group, uh, or uh, certainly humanist groups, and it and beyond humanist groups, will say that recruiting folks is a challenge, uh, retaining folks is a challenge, and uh, and uh, that you know, 95% uh, of the work is done by 3% of the people. Yes, the 90-10 rule is uh, is a lie. It's actually, I think, uh, it's probably 95 or 98% of the work is done by uh, by 2% of the folks. So, um, so I want to take some broader, uh, just some broader step back as I, we've at Humanist Canada really have been looking at ways and we're not, I, I don't want to suggest that we're the model, but I've been active in local groups and small groups of many kinds, and uh, and I think there's some good lessons to take away. And the first one uh, I want to suggest, and um, and I I just have to confirm with the author, but uh, Mark Schaus wrote an article uh, a couple of years ago and uh, titled uh, Stepping Out of the Master Shadow, Seven Habits of Highly Successful Humanist Groups Worldwide. And uh, there's a couple of those uh, um, habits that I think are really useful for us. I mean, uh, uh, all, all of them would be, but they really do pertain to some larger groups rather than local groups. And, uh, and the first one, um, you know, in 2021 is that uh, a dedicated social media presence in terms of recruiting new members is, uh, is crucial. And, uh, uh, what I can tell you uh, from Humanist Canada's experience that since we've had a dedicated um, uh, social media presence that's been focused on the offerings that we're providing is that uh, our membership consistently grows and, uh, and that has made a huge difference. So for example, we now have 40 uh, student members who are part of the organization. Uh, but I can tell you month over month over month since we've had the dedicated social media, our membership consistently grows. And, and that, you know, excludes the people who don't renew, um, uh, but our, our membership is continuing to grow. Uh, a point that Doug made certainly was uh, the idea about having a cause. So I think uh, I would say that uh, successful groups both have an internal and an external focus, and uh, not either or, but I would say an and, and uh, and so that there's something that meets the needs of those who gather, and then there's something that has some outward kind of outreach, and uh, whatever that may be, and um, and I can think of. Um, the uh, you know whether that's you know providing I we I did something very simple for example that we did at uh, at Toronto Oasis which was uh, for everybody when they came out to a month a weekly gathering was the opportunity for people to bring uh, toothbrushes toothpaste um, that they would have collected at a hotel and we would donate that to a shelter. There was absolutely nothing, uh, uh, you know, complicated about this. 
But honestly, we, every week we had people making that kind of a contribution and, uh, and then it would be delivered to a local shelter and, uh, and it was a very worthwhile um, gathering. So uh, after COVID, we hope to see that resume. So that's an example of how something simple can be. If you're having an in-person gathering and all of us have been limited by that, uh, having people do something as simple as, uh, you know, bringing uh, and, uh, a, you know, an item like a canned item uh, or at particular times of the year where those things can be donated. So there's a sense of having uh, coming together, but a sense of having a perspective of, of reaching out. Another item I would say that's been hugely significant is um, networking. Uh, networking is you know, with causes that are allied, you know, it means that A, we can uh, invite people, cross promote. And if humanism is still the number one best kept secret in this country, uh, these provide wonderful opportunities to be able to connect with folks. And and uh, we've been in that nationally, and it's a difference. And, uh, and wherever we can locally, it makes a difference. So recruiting, um, and uh, as Doug had said, you know, there is no magic bullet here. Uh, but one of the ways that I think that we need to be thinking about is really, if we come down to some core principles, what is our group about? And who would actually be our ideal member? And uh, so often we don't think about that, but who would be our ideal member? And, uh, and I think when we begin to think about who might be the ideal member in our group, once we have a sense of what we're about, is then it begins to provide an opportunity for us to help focus and, and target on who that person or who those persons might be. So one of the ways of beginning this process is um, there was a study done by a, uh, a software called Wild, Wild Apricot. It's a membership software. And they had identified that 90% of organizations don't track why members joined. Now, it seems like a no-brainer. People join, um, and we might assume that we know why they joined, but we often, if the data is correct, and I would say it certainly is true for us at UMass Canada, 90% of organizations don't know why they join. So one of, I think, our challenges is, is that discovering why people joined and, uh, and why they're joining so that we can do more of it if we know what that is, and it's not going to be one thing, but what are those things, so we can actually do more of it. Second, another element is um, our onboarding of members. And, uh, and, you know, this might sound like a technical kind of thing, but if we've all been to an event and you walk in and let's say you don't know anybody and you're the stranger there and everybody is in their little cliques and they're talking to each other and uh, they don't think to reach out to you, that might be a good example of, you know, of poor onboarding in person. And so onboarding is really about how we make people feel welcome. And, uh, and we do that digitally, we do that in all kinds of ways. And we probably are much, uh, have a better sense of how we do that in person, but not always so well. So I'm going to come back to a, in an in-person example of uh, at Toronto Oasis as um, where we actually had somebody who was a greeter um, so that uh, whenever people arrived, there was at least a friendly face to reach out to them. And not only were they a greeter, but they were kind of like a networker. And in a short conversation to find out a little something about them and immediately to be able to think about somebody else in the group who might be an interesting connection. So already now they haven't met just one person, but maybe two or maybe three. Um, by a simple practice of asking a couple of questions. So onboarding of members. 
Um, and how we do that, you know, consistently. So we might assume that members know, um, know what they're there for. And people may, whatever it was that brought people is uh, uh, pe people might spin to the don't know much involved or of members so a they feel welcome they know what's available to them uh, they those are key things because um i'm i'm going to take us through to the end of the membership cycle which is the best retention policy is having a good onboarding policy and so the theory the practice is that if we onboard people well in our organization they're we're more likely to retain them um, and, uh, and that may seem like an obvious flow, but it certainly wasn't for me. Um, we might need to, uh, when we think about our current members in a game, and uh, this is about recruiting is so often we forget is who are going to be our best ambassadors or recruiters. And those are going to be the people who are already members. And, uh, and so, uh, so this isn't just about new members, but how we keep our current members having so that they have a sense of the value of being part of the organization. So it could be something as simple as we, again, I'm going to refer to Toronto Oasis as a local group, which I've been a part of, is where we invited people to bring a friend on, a, uh, on one of our weekly gatherings. If you have an activity, bring a friend. Um, if, you know, as an organization where we're looking at, you know, people being able to bring a friend and, you know, we'll give them a coffee mug, um, uh, you know, to do that and one for the new member so there are all of this comes back to again how do we grow our organization is again through people who are already members um so often and anybody my experience in being leadership of 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 large organizations and small organizations is the importance of personal contact. So we can easily say we can put out, uh, you know, an email to say we need somebody to help with this. And uh, I don't know what your experience is like. Uh, mine is that it's generally uh, a pretty sad response and uh, and really can uh, can be challenging. So. However, I can tell you that whenever I have successfully recruited, it's because I've reached out to an individual and been able to say, you know, I think you'd be great doing this. You don't have to know everything, um, but uh, we'll, we'll help you along the way. And uh, my experience is that 90% of the time is that the individuals that I reach out to personally uh, will be happy uh, to take on a task. And I'm not reaching out to people who aren't necessarily personally my friend. I'm reaching out to people who clearly exhibit some skills of leadership and follow through and have some personality. Um, you know, the, if you're looking to recruit members, your introvert in the group is not likely going to be that person. So who might be is somebody who has uh, a little more of an extroverted personality. Um, I'd like to suggest, and we've dug and touched on this, about the importance of regular events. And, uh, and so, uh, and having said that, the importance of regular events and then I would say it's the importance of having uh, more than one regular event a month. And uh, what the experience has been is that one regular event a month isn't enough for people to truly feel engaged. And so there needs to be more than one event a month. And with that, I would suggest there needs to be a diversity of events. So, Yes, there may be something where we're, you know, let's say we're all going to gather and, uh, and as a group, as a humanist group, and we're going to um, go to uh, the food bank and pack boxes. 
and to, to be assistance. And we want to do that as a group. So that's uh, something. Uh, and so some people may want to do that. Some people may want to do the discussion group. Some people may want to do the movie night. Some people may want to meet for a beer at a pub and, uh, and have a conversation. And so no one person is likely going to want to do all of those things. And, 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 uh, and so the importance of having a variety of events for people to engage in at their own comfort level. And once they're engaged, they may find themselves wanting to do other things because somebody they know is going to be doing that other activity as well. So diversity of events is kind of key. Um, the, a couple of other uh, items that I'd wanted to touch on, and one is um, it's built into engaging people. And I realize I'm going, I've been going for about 12 minutes, so I'm going to wrap this up in a moment so we can engage some others. But I want to suggest um, in the last year, uh, I know of three groups that have folded and uh, or are, have really struggled. And uh, at the heart of those groups struggling or actually folding was that the leadership was burnt out. There weren't other people to step in. And so inherently part of all of this um, is that we need to think about succession planning. And, uh, and so sometimes it can be easier just to do things yourself, but it's really critical to be building because if that one person disappears, you know, that could mean it's a chunk of your group's activities. And, uh, and, uh, and other people may not have gotten involved because somebody was always doing that, which was great, but we didn't think we should have somebody who's shadowing them or doing that with that person who's been the laudable volunteer or leader who's been making things happen. So how do we engage people along the way? So A, there's an institutional memory and B, there is some succession planning. And that's a really a critical thing for any groups that have, uh, you know, that survive over the long haul. And um, two last things that I'll finish up on. And, uh, and, and the second last is that I think that we need to be doing things that have a positive focus. And so whatever the spin is, and however we take on tasks, we need to find what's the positive lens in all of this. And uh, so that we're just not, uh, you know, protesting something, but we're bringing a positive humanist worldview. And all of us find it much more easier, to, uh, certainly I do, to gather around a positive focus than I do around something that's negative. And then lastly, in literally every involvement where I've stepped forward, uh, and this will say a lot about my personality, but it has to be fun. And uh, when I'm involved on the board of Humanist Canada, I genuinely like the people I'm involved with. And there needs to be something there that's fun with me. Uh, at Toronto Oasis in local leadership, you know, there needs to be something that's fun there. And I find if the leadership of a small group is actually enjoying each other's company, then it's much, it's infectious, it's infectious. And other people will find and enjoy that energy as well. So, um, so that's, uh, and so for me, if I'm gonna take on a volunteer commitment and there isn't some element of fun to it, uh, or I can't find an element of fun in it, I'm not interested count me out. So, um, uh, and, you know, by George, I think everything that I've done, I, you know, uh, I've been able to find something fun. And when I can't, then I have moved on. So I will stop talking there. And, uh, uh, but before I do, I wanted to ask, I've spoken to a couple of folks who uh, are small group leaders, uh, who have had I think some really um, success and who also struggle with this challenge of growing. So I wanted to ask Richard Dowsett, who's this on the uh, steering committee chair at the Humanist Association of Toronto to say a few words just about um, your discoveries about what has worked well for HAT. Richard. 
Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to hear uh, Martin and uh, Doug talking about uh, the humanist communities because they're su so successful within their different spheres. Um, so I've been involved with the Humanist uh, Association of Toronto since 2011, and when I started to become a humanist. And uh, over that time, there was a, a period, I guess, of stability, you know, increasing stability of the organization. But since that time, I guess we've uh, done a little more to kind of continue uh, what, what has been uh, growing in the past. We've been around since 1990, so we do have some organizational history there as well. Um, I guess the, the, the thing that we've done that we found to be quite successful is what Martin was talking about, having a diversity of programs uh, within three different spheres, I suppose, uh, that uh, like uh, almost like a, a, st a, a stool with three legs, um, being education, connection, and community involvement. The connection being the kind of internal, uh, inward-facing kind of uh, events that build kind of a connection between our people, and then community involvement being um, connecting ourselves to the more wider community and the more outward-facing. Uh, to show our relevance to the to the local community and also to make sure that people understand what that humanism isn't just a bunch of people talking to each other it's it's having an effect on the wider world that you know that there's a bigger world out there and so we've tried to have a diversity of those events um, that focus on uh, social um, getting people to talk about their own vulnerability to talk about their own personality and their own per uh, uh, personhood to build, I guess, uh, connections between the members so that they're doing things outside of HAT, but together as humanists. And so that's a very important thing. What we've done there is to um, make sure there's a lot of opportunities for in, uh, connection, casual connection between people outside of the events to have parties and social events uh, within the organization and some informal chats like our Wednesday night HAT chat. Every Wednesday was started during the pandemic as a way for people to kind of decompress and uh, make sure that the, to avoid the social isolation that the pandemic has brought on. But I think it's a program that we're going to continue for the long term, um, that just that consistency, the weekly program that doesn't get out the same, it gets out small numbers of people, but they're small numbers who can then relate to each other on a different basis than some of the larger group meetings. And it's a different sort of kettle of fish every time you come on every Wednesday, it's a different bunch of people. And so that's uh, increasing those networking, those connections between people so that they're interacting at all times. Then there's the, uh, the educational component, which is uh, all our uh, discussion groups, our speaker events. Uh, and again, using that idea of building affiliations with other organizations that have ideas like ours and making sure that even other humanist groups are also very connected as well. So we want our, uh, especially in Toronto um, and around the world now with Zoom, of course, the, the, the idea is to have a nonstop um, community of like a, a, a schedule of events that are available each month so that your hat can have a number of events that people can attend, but that our hat members and Oasis members can attend each other's events, that we can attend OHS events, so we can look at a Humanist Canada seminars and uh, and speaker events on the weekends. And so that humanists always have a place to go if they're free to make sure that they can go to another event. And we don't want to uh, get siloed within our own communities or uh, having a sort of a tree hugger effect where we're constantly thinking about our own recruitment, but instead making sure that our, our all of our sister organizations are also being well attended as well because it's better for all of us. And so I guess uh, the other the part that we've had a little more problem with, and I'll be looking for assistance within the uh, the small groups, is the community involvement. Uh, again, finding a focus, uh, an outward focus for our group, our an action component instead of just talking and socializing and relating. That we've got actually a an action that people can get involved in and get behind to get to give it more relevance and for those people who really appreciate there are action oriented people who just they they don't want to talk about things they want to do things and so i think that that's been an area where we've had less success and i'll be looking for some more input from uh, my fellow organizers thank you great thanks so much richard and uh, 
So I guess the, uh, Anna, if I uh, can turn it back to you and we can actually look at moving into the next phase of the. Uh... Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Doug Martin. Thank you, Richard. So uh, let's uh, have a, a discussion in smaller groups. Uh, I see there are 23 people on the call, so maybe we can have four breakout groups. Uh, and bear with me, I've never done this before. Um, Martin can help me out if I mess up. So it's a, a good opportunity to meet others and exchange ideas, share your experiences, uh, since uh, we know that at least 60% of uh, participants on the call belong to a humanist group. So uh, uh, let's see what happens. And uh, let's give it 15 to 20 minutes, if that's OK. Um, and uh, to guide the conversation, I'll uh, put a couple of questions in the chat. Obviously, you don't have to uh, um, you know, ad address these questions. Uh, it can be an open conversation. So the first would be, tell us about your group, focus, programs, activities, and uh, is your group facing any challenges and how do you address these? What works, what doesn't? So I think it would be useful to uh, brainstorm as well this sort of information. But again, feel free to you know have um, have a conversation of, of your choice. And so if if uh, we can have one person who can you know not a formal note taker, but who can then report back and uh, share some of the highlights from your group conversations uh, when we're back in the main channel, that would be great. So uh, let's see in the group but uh, i'll be the spokesman outside of it uh we've concluded that um uh north dublin is an ideal place to go uh just wonderful pubs wonderful people um but uh we've also decided that um if you wanted to start um getting started uh in uh to form your own uh humanist group uh now via zoom would probably be the biggest hurdle you're going to have because end of the day on people's free time last thing a lot of people want to do is sit in another damn zoom meeting um but uh but if you are able to get a group together just a simple group um that would be obviously ideal you, can, you know uh when things open up if they ever do um which uh we'll get to have um you, you could try different ideas like having a, a film night to talk about film sometimes it's not people's cup of tea you want to try other things we were halfway through barry's wonderful ideas but uh, then we got uh beamed outside of the room but um i'm pretty much you decided that uh if you can get a group, uh, just a simple group of maybe three or four going, just enough people to get interested and, and continuously uh, post here and there, uh, just to say that we exist. If you wanna come in, uh, take uh, accepting walk-ins, that'd be a great way to get people, new people and curious who want to uh, talk about. I mean, it doesn't have to be necessary to talk about one specific topic, but just general things uh, happening in the local area, that'd be a really great way to, 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 to at least garner a lot of interest, get new people in the door, and really get the local community together. But primarily in North Dublin, if you can do it. Uh, Thanks, Jared. I Thanks think so North Dublin is the worst possible time zone for anybody in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> we're the wrong side of things for you, but uh, we would we would expect you to sit up with your cocoa at midnight to talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Can I talk? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, is yours. Well, I guess we were room three. I don't know what that meant, but anyway, we, we were in room three and uh, we had three people, Megan and Carol and I, I'm Tim Moore, and uh, we, um, we, disc we uh, Megan uh, comes from Peterborough and she's uh, new there and she's interested in starting up a group in, in Peterborough. Carol is from Thunder Bay and I think she belongs to the Ontario Humanist Association, and we talked about the differences between the different levels, the Canadian-wide one, the Ontario one, the, the local ones, and whether it was beneficial and necessary to, to join all of them, and what were the benefits of, of different places. We talked about Carol becoming, uh, had become an officiant, and uh, Megan was asking whether these officiants were Canada-wide or province-wide, and I think Carol thought 
for, thinks, and, and I, I think I agree, that they're province-wide, but, but that um, Ontario, that um, the Canada-wide one uh, will put people in touch with officials uh, that are local to, the, to them. So I, I understand that's what was the situation. So we just discussed that. I, I talked about the fact that I'm a new member of the Humanist Canada, a Humanist Association in Canada and on Ottawa, but uh, I'm fairly new and I've never met anybody in practice. So it's kind of, we've always met on these uh, Zoom meetings and it's it's been a little strange, but it's been interesting. And so that's how it, how the discussion went. I don't know whether Carol wants to add anything because um, I, I agreed with Carol beforehand that I should speak first just so that somebody started, but uh, I don't know, Carol's still uh, muted. So if Carol wants to, to mention something, then uh, I'll let, leave it to her. No, I don't really have anything else to say. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, group two? Yep, thank you. Thank you. John. Remy, you're muted. We can't hear you, Remy. Oh. Hi, I'm Remy. Uh, we're group two. Uh, me, Doug, uh, Moses, Carrie. Um, sorry, I'm forgetting everyone's names. Uh, we talked mostly about uh, attracting and retaining new members as well as the problem of succession, which I think all of us are having difficulty with. Um, and then overcoming the challenges coming out of COVID. And uh, uh, Doug, do you wanna take anything from there? Oh, maybe. I think, yeah, I think we, we talked to some extent about the the need to recruit younger people and Moses was, uh, I think had the right idea that we need to get, I'll sound subversive here, into the universities and into the colleges and try to get those young people involved, um, which at least in the universities in our area requires that you have some kind of connection in there, a professor who's gonna sponsor it or something like that to start up a secular humanist group and then support that group um, financially, perhaps, or even, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but the Christian groups have gobs of money that they get from the various churches, and we need to step up to the plate on that. Um, and then we talked about succession, yeah. And I think it came through in a couple of comments that having a purpose, having uh, your group have some kind of charitable purpose, for people to work on that they can get some satisfaction out of is key to retain people and recruit people. Um, I mean, getting out for a beer only goes so far. And I understand the, the attraction of North Dublin, although I'd say North Waterloo would be <laughs> okay too. Um, the, you know, and co Canadians don't drink cocoa at midnight. That's more likely to be wine or beer uh but at any rate uh the, but the point is that it, it, it is uh there's got to be more than just the socializing aspect it's that there needs to be some some purpose um there i said all i need to say <laughs> okay thank you uh, if i can if i can just jump in there i was in the Please. same group and um we ran out of time so i didn't get to share this so I'll share it with the whole group now. Um, I'm originally from Northern Ireland. And uh, when I lived in Northern Ireland, of course, it was a very religious culture, uh, humanist, atheist, gay and lesbian people. All of those groups were very much in the closet. Um, I, I'm very pleased to look back on, on Northern Ireland now, which I left in 1972, and see that humanists are now making a major impact in Northern Ireland that they're very much out of the closet now. And one of the ways they were able to do that was uh, to start officiating um, non-religious wedding ceremonies. And uh, that just, just blossomed like crazy. Suddenly, uh, it, was as if, it was as if a light went on in, in Northern Ireland. People realized, oh my God, um, we, we don't have to believe in God to get married. 
I, I can I can have a, a humanist wedding, uh, and and now they're becoming really really popular, um, also in Scotland as well. So th I think that is how they got on on the map, and and now they have a, a large political influence in Northern Ireland, and they're getting very much involved in in you know abortion access and uh, LGBTQ rights, and they now have uh, humanist chaplains in the prisons in Northern Ireland. So, I mean, this is just a total transformation from when I lived there. Um, so, so one way in Canada, we could, if possible, you know, try to promote non-religious humanist weddings and also memorial ceremonies, uh, which is what I do actually here in Sarnia. And I, I can tell you there's, there's, a, there's a need for it. Uh, people are hungry for, for this alternative. If I could comment there. I I mean, the Humanist Association of Ireland in its present form was essentially founded to provide ceremonies. Uh, and humanist weddings, I've forgotten the figures, but I think they're about equal to the number of Catholic weddings now, which in the Republic of Ireland is an extraordinary figure. And uh, the guy who was largely responsible for setting up uh, humanist celebrants and now officiants uh, reckoned that about 220,000 people a year attend a humanist ceremony, mostly weddings. 220,000, that's a huge number in a very small country. We've only 5 million people in Ireland. Um, and nearly everybody you meet uh, says, oh yeah, I was at a, 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 a humanist wedding or a humanist funeral, and it was really good. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it was so personal. I mean, any of us who've been to religious funerals, uh, many of them are very formulaic. and Sometimes you think, did, did the officiant even know the deceased? Well, very often didn't. Um, and it, whereas the humanist ones are quite different. Uh, they may not have known the deceased, but they've taken the trouble to find out very quickly about the deceased and they know the family because they've met them. So th there, that is a real meaning and it is a real great way of reaching out, I, I think, to the population as a whole. Uh, and. I agree. Uh, Northern Ireland, just 100 kilometres up the road from me, um, have done great strides. They, of course, have got three humanist organisations in true uh, Northern Ireland style. Uh, but anyway, they, they are making noises. Yes, thanks very much, Alan. Um, uh, I was referring to Northern Ireland, so I wasn't aware of what was happening in the Republic of Ireland. Well, that's fair enough. Yeah. Why yes, would you? Yeah. Very, very encouraging. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So one last group to hear from. Uh, Richard, do you want to touch base on group four? Yeah, we kind of never decided who our reporter was going to be. So I'll, I'll give you what notes I've got and maybe <laughs> uh, maybe Martin and uh, uh, JM and uh, uh, who else was in our group? Uh, Tristy. Tristy. Tristy can, uh, can fill George. in the blank. So certainly uh, we were talking about the, uh, Tristy was uh, talking about the the her interest in um, uh, combining with different uh, uh, intersectional groups, inter intersectional subgroups, so to have uh, you know a black humanist group, an LGBTQ two plus uh, humanist group, uh, a, uh, a women's unit, a humanist group, because traditionally in our country, anyways, in Canada, there has been a, a real overrepresentation, I suppose, in humanists for white male kind of Anglo people. And certainly within our group uh, for HAT, that is has changed quite a bit so that the gender representation is kind of a lot more diverse now, at least between male and male and female, if not between all of the genders that are that are represented. Um, but certainly we still have problems in attracting other uh, sort of racialized communities and people of color that they don't necessarily see themselves represented. So they might come for a few times and then find that it feels maybe not exclusive exactly, but just doesn't represent them enough. And so it's hard for us to divide certainly between subgroups because we're, we just don't have that representation. But uh, but Tristy was certainly very interested in uh, meeting some of more of those sort of groups. And maybe that's something that uh, Humanist Canada can more represent because we're talking about, you know, 150 members and uh, and only 30 or 40 of those being active. And so it's hard to represent that way. And I guess it was the um, I was talking about the, the unique struggles of just the chicken and egg factor of having to wanting to appeal to those groups, have that diversity of thought 
and diversity of representation to give us a more, you know, a balanced view, I suppose. But then that, how do you reach out to those communities enough when they're not seeing you already really represented within your organization? And so, again, that problem of you need someone from that organization to at least give the idea that you're friendly in those areas. Um, and even though we're actually, uh, our venue is a, uh, the, the center of the LGBTQ2 plus community in Toronto, we haven't seen our uh, membership in the gay community or lesbian community burgeon because of that. And it's not enough. So we're still trying to figure out ways to kind of uh, reach out to those communities uh, with the trust and faith that they that they'll that they'll be they'll find themselves to be uh, you know able to to relate. Um, those were the two main topics I identified. Right, and the only th other thing I was going to add, it, you had highlighted, Richard, was that uh, you know if you ask people if they're a member, and they might say yes, have they paid a membership? No, but they might identify because they've been to activities or they're part of the Facebook group. And uh, so I think the model of membership, you know, that, um, you know, having people interested and having them become more and more involved through successive interactions seems to be a model, you know, less more of the past than it is, you know, of the future. And uh, so um, how do we engage people in different ways other than that traditional membership? You know, they're not going to become a member and ultimately, you know, have a goal to become, you know, the leadership of the organization. You know, they uh, they're happy uh, not maybe not to be involved in that way. Um, and then lastly, I was just going to say just to the comment about, um, you know, uh, uh, Humanist Weddings and, and uh, Humanist Canada is launching or has launched a national chaplaincy program. So this is very exciting. and. Um, and you'll be hearing more about this, but uh, we just signed a memorandum of understanding with the Canadian Armed Forces, and uh, and I think within the next six to twelve months we will have a couple of humanist chaplains in the Canadian Armed Forces. So um, they're already in process. So this is an incredible milestone uh, for humanism in Canada. And uh, Shristi uh, Huku, who's on the call, is also uh, a humanist chaplain, and uh, and uh, as am I, uh, uh, and you know, both an efficient and a humanist chaplain. Uh, so we're just this program is just in its infancy stages, but it's very exciting uh, for the future uh, and to be recognized by uh, our Canadian Armed Forces. So stay tuned. Uh, back to you, Anna, for the wrap up. It's, uh... Uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, there, there is a great uh, question in the chat room. Uh, how do I identify a cause for a local group? And this is something that we're working on or struggling with a little bit as well or discussing. Uh, there are also a whole bunch of comments. I don't know, Martin, so I can do a, a, a sort of formal wrap up and leave the meeting open if people want to, you know, stick around and continue the conversation. Uh, um, or we can end it here in the hopes that, you know, we can organize a follow-up session as well. I think it'd be great to organize a follow-up just to be respectful of people's time. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay. Um, sounds good. So then thank you all for joining us this afternoon and for participating, for uh, sharing your thoughts. We'll uh, definitely will be revisiting them. And uh, I would like to invite you to fill out a survey, which I will drop in the chat in a second to let us know your thoughts about the workshop, if you have any suggestions or feedback. And you can also suggest a uh, topic of interest or a speaker you'd like us to invite. Um, and uh, uh, finally, we will be resuming our programs and webinars in January of 2022. And uh, just to announce our next speaker, uh, she, uh, Crystal Fraser, Dr. Crystal Fraser from the University of Alberta. And she will talk about the history of Indian residential schools in the context of the recent very unfortunate events, uh, discoveries of unmarked graves. And uh, 
on that note, thank and, you all for joining, and I will drop the link in the chat box. And okay. So, and Martin, before you, you want before, to say a few words, yeah. Before we wrap, is just if you'd in the comments on the survey, if you'd please identify uh, how you'd like to carry this conversation forward, because I think so many of us are still feeling like we're in the same spot about, you know, strategies for growing. Um, uh, are there some best practices that you've discovered that we haven't already talked about? and uh, so that we can uh, keep this conversation certainly alive and uh, uh, um, that would be fantastic. Um, so thank you. Perfect and there's a link so if you can grab that that would be great and thank you so much for joining us.